church of love. Welcome to the church of love. The church of love.
Greetings and blessings from the south suburbs of Chicago, and welcome to the Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood, where the lost can be found, where the dying can receive light, and where the saints can be encouraged. The church of love. Welcome to the church of love. Good evening, brothers and sisters of Calvary Baptist Church of Glenwood. I pray that on this evening in particular, that at this moment that we find one another strengthened and encouraged, especially after the harrowing events of yesterday and which throughout not only our county, not only throughout our state, but the surrounding states and the surrounding um, upper Midwest, all the way to the lower Midwest, in which there were several storms with winds in excess of 70 miles per hour, some recorded at 74 miles per hour, in which there was the absolute destruction of property and homes and land, so I pray that this evening, that wherever you may be and however you may be in recovering or perhaps in a place where you are lending assistance and helping others, I pray that you are indeed abiding in the grace and in the strength of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ who preserves us and who protects us in all situations and in all matters according to his own perfect foreknowledge and set purpose. This evening I'm so blessed as always to um, be in your presence by way of the diligence and the commitment and the hard work of our media ministry which allows us to be able to connect with one another um, throughout the various bandwidths, through the airwaves, through whatever means, whether through phones or tablets or smart TVs, it is not the technology connecting us as much as it is the commitment of our brothers and sisters in the media ministry whose tireless efforts and work are what allow us to continue to reach one another, to worship together, and to connect with one another. This evening, we're going to journey into one of the authentic Pauline epistles, one of the unquestionably verifiable letters of Paul. And this evening, we'll say quite a bit about how we're able to verify that the epistle to the Galatians is, in fact, not only one of the authentic Pauline letters, but unknowns, unbeknownst to Paul at that time, but would later serve in the following three centuries for all congregations and later denominations, this epistle to the Galatians would form one of the most important doctrinal foundations that defines the Christian faith. That regardless of what denomination, regardless of how one accepts and confesses Jesus as savior, it is this particular letter that forms a universal doctrine, a doctrine that is now called the universal doctrine of the church, which we call justification. And we're going to explore that um, in some detail this evening and what that meant for Paul in the context of Gentiles and Jewish believers in what we believe was the Roman province of Galatia. And so this evening, I am just overjoyed and blessed and humbled to have this opportunity to share with you that we shall continue to grow in God's word. And as we grow in God's word, we are able with greater courage and confidence to not only with words, but with deeds to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. It was, after all, St. Francis of Assisi who said, preach the gospel at all times and use words if necessary. And so as we proceed, as always, we want to, as I've heard one preacher from my youth say, before we do anything, we want to make sure that we punch in and punch the clock by way of giving assent and giving adulation and glorification of our Lord and Savior, that is to begin in all things with prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are created in your image and that you have placed us upon the foundation of this earth. 
Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it is to you we humbly open our hearts and our minds at this moment that we may more greatly understand you. Blessed Holy Spirit, it is you who strengthens us at this moment and in all moments. And so we praise you, O oh God, for you are truly good. Truly good. Your grace has no ending. Your mercy has no bounds. Your faithfulness is perfect and sustaining in every way. And so it is in full celebration of you, in great appreciation of you, that we now, now hear from your word, that your word speaks to us, that it shall be fully applied to our hearts and to our lives and to our work, to our deeds and to our words. And we give you the glory for every good thing, for every fruit, from the first fruit to the last fruit that is yielded from this, your holy word. And we praise you and bless your name for giving us these scriptures that we may understand you and understand ourselves in relationship to you. For you are divine and perfect and exalted. This prayer we offer, we offer in the majestic name. This prayer we lift up in that perfect and almighty name. In the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who redeems us all and who redeems this world, we pray. Amen and amen. The epistle to the Galatians. What is so interesting about this particular letter, and the first thing that helps us to understand its authenticity, is Paul begins this letter by recounting the events from Acts chapter 15, verses 1 through 29. Now, in Acts chapter 15, this is known as the council at Jerusalem. And the council at Jerusalem assembled because at this point, as the church began growing, there were some basic questions that demanded answers. And one such question was, do Gentiles need to be circumcised? And so there was a group of individuals known in 1 Corinthians as the outsiders, also known as the Judaizers. So the early church was split up into two groups. There were the Jewish believers and then there were the Gentile believers. At the outset of Paul's ministry, about 95% of the church was made up of Jewish believers. And about 5% was Gentile. And so the council at Jerusalem met, and these were all of the pillars of the church. The Bible says the pillars, Peter, John, James, the brother of Jesus. And the earliest of the apostles met to decide what will the rule be concerning Gentiles? Do Gentiles have to be circumcised? And so it is in Genesis chapter 17 that we're specifically told that circumcision is that which served as a sign of humility before the Lord. And so the question became, for Jewish believers, they understood Jesus as the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. And so how could Gentiles join the church unless they first were under the Mosaic law and then were to undergo circumcision and then accept Jesus? And so Paul goes as far as to introduce a new innovation in the church, considered dangerous by the Judaizers and opposed by Peter and opposed by James, and later even opposed by Barnabas. Justification by faith. Paul introduces this theological doctrine. Justification speaks to the means through which we are saved. And the opposite of this would be what is considered works righteousness. 
This is to say that there are things a human being must do in order to be considered righteous. And Paul goes as far as to say Jesus died for nothing if we have to keep doing things after we confess him. The purpose of his sacrifice is that the confession takes the place of circumcision. And this is the means to which the gospel then is given to the world. Peter did not embrace this. James did not embrace this. Barnabas did not embrace this. However, during the council at Jerusalem, it was decided that an argument could be made for either. Paul himself was a rabbi and remained a rabbi throughout his life, but he professed and confessed Jesus. Paul underwent not a full conversion, but what is called a call conversion, which only he had undergone. A conversion speaks of someone moving from one faith to another or moving from sinner to saved. A calling is what one has after they have been converted. Paul is unique in that he was always a rabbi, but he first persecuted the church because he did not believe that Jesus was the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant. After his encounter with Jesus en route to Damascus, it was at that time that Paul then clearly understood. In fact, he even says when speaking to Festus and Agrippa, Jesus spoke to him in Hebrew, furthermore confirming for him that Jesus was in fact the fulfillment of the Mosaic law. So he saw the Mosaic law as provisional and as a temporary disciplinarian until the crucifixion. But the crucifixion and the tearing of the curtain now meant that a confession is what reconciled us to God and that there was no more need for circumcision and the Mosaic law as the means through which we are reconciled to God. So Peter, again, I stress, as we're going to see, not only did not accept this, Peter, in large part, had a number of Judaizers who would serve as what was called a truth squad. They would follow Paul. Paul would preach, then they would come behind Paul and unpreach everything that he had preached. He would speak to someone, they would go behind him, and then unteach everything. And this, this was one of the, the three groups, the Judaizers, the outsiders, and the super apostles. The super apostles he encounters later in Corinth. So every time Paul preached, there were opponents who followed him to undo the work. And so he was always fighting against a schism, and he was always in this process of maturation. So what we see is whenever he's writing this letter to the church in Galatia, in the first chapter, he does something that he does not do elsewhere, but using his authentic language. He's shocked. He essentially says he's shocked to hear that they are preaching some other gospel, that he only knows of one gospel, that Jesus Christ died for the sins of everyone and anyone who confesses him is forgiven. So he essentially begins by saying, I'm surprised to hear that you're preaching some other gospel. In other words, his understanding was simple, and it's our understanding today. When you confess him, that is it. That is what you have to do. Everything else is symbolic after that. So in the second chapter, which is what we're going to examine, we're going to see how he begins for the first 10 verses with his biography. Paul is constantly reminding people of what he had done and what he had done in certain places. But what is so helpful here is, as I mentioned, the church had met, capital C, in Jerusalem for a council, but in verses 30 of the Acts of the Apostles, in your background, you will see that there's a transition that occurs between 30 and then between 36 and 41. Paul goes to Antioch with Barnabas because it is decided by the council that Paul will go and preach to the Gentiles and Peter and James and John will preach to Jewish converts. But then there comes the separation of Paul and Barnabas, which seemingly is over the matter of John Mark, that Paul did not want John Mark to accompany them any further because he had deserted them in Pamphylia. But upon reading chapter 15, it's obvious Barnabas sides with Peter and James and John as being the authoritative voices of the church. This is one of the first times and the most important times in the church that we understand there were two rights at the same time to address the same matter. 
Peter and Paul wanted the same thing and had very differing views as to how to ultimately proliferate or spread the gospel. So it's important to know what happens here that Luke records in Acts because Paul spends the first 10 verses of chapter 2 describing everything that happened here. And everything that happened here happened over the course of 14 years. So he's describing the first 14 years of his ministry. He's also describing his first missionary journey, which we have a great deal of detail about in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, Acts chapter 18, verse 23. This will be the first missionary journey and a reference to the third missionary journey. We use this chronology, and chronology is the order. We use this chronology that Luke, the first ever church historian, gives us to know in what order Paul went where. So when we read Paul's letters, we can tell which letters he wrote and did not write because Paul knew in which order he was preaching at churches. Luke knew in which order. So then we can tell which letters were inserted later as inauthentic letters because they are inconsistent with the chronology and the timeline that we have of the missionary journeys. So we're going to jump right into chapter two. And again, these first 10 verses are going to look at Paul wrapping up this description of his biography, his missionary journeys over the course of 14 years. And then he's going to transition in verse 11 to the matter at hand concerning Gentiles and circumcision. So chapter two starting with verse one, then after 14 years. So right there we have at the opening, after 14 years. So he has described in chapter one where he has been, what he has been doing, the council at Jerusalem and so forth. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up in response to a revelation. Then I laid before them though only in a private meeting with the acknowledged leaders, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles, in order to make sure that I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not compelled to be circumcised, though he was Greek, but because of false believers secretly brought in, who slipped in to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus, so that they might enslave us. We did not submit to them, even for a moment, so that the truth of the gospel might always remain with you. And from those who were supposed to be acknowledged leaders, what they actually were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Those leaders contributed nothing to me. On the contrary, when they saw that I had been entrusted with the gospel for the, um, for the uncircumcised, just as Peter had been entrusted with the gospel for the circumcised, for he who worked through Peter, making him an apostle to the circumcised, also worked through me in sending me to the Gentiles. And when James and Cephas, Cephas is also Peter, and John, who were acknowledged pillars, recognized the grace that had been given to me, they gave to Barnabas and me the right hand of fellowship, agreeing that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. They asked only one thing, that we remember the poor, which was actually what I was eager to do. So what Paul is doing here, he's describing to the Galatians the reason that he is preaching a gospel that does not require circumcision for Gentiles. And in fact, when you read Acts 15 as background for this, you will know that the council at Jerusalem actually had written and then had actually um, embroidered a letter, or today we would say notarized, that they had placed a seal on a letter that had in fact proven that they had voted and they had chosen that what would be done is Gentiles would not have to be circumcised, but that they could not eat things considered unclean or considered um, to be um, food reserved for pagans, that they could not engage in the use of any um, blood in terms of the practices common to pagans. I'll give you an example um, so you can have a better sense of the types of practices they would have been involved in. What Paul was very good at doing was culturally contextualizing his sermons. 
You see in Acts chapter 17, when he would preach before Cretans, he would quote their own prophets and poets when he was before the image of the unknown God. Paul knew how to culturally contextualize. That is, he could use the language of the land and the people. And so there was a pagan god known as Mithras who was popularly worshipped. Mithras. And Mithras um, took on the image of a bull with the body of a human. And so what pagans would do is they would take a living bull and they would string it up and then they would cut it open and they would stand underneath it and be washed in its blood. Their belief was as the blood of the bull descended upon them, they would take on the strength of this pagan god. Paul, in preaching to them, had to explain Jesus to Gentiles who were accustomed to this practice. So what Paul brilliantly, through his anointing, does, he uses language that appeals to Jewish believers, but also that was culturally understood by Gentiles. Jewish believers understood the Paschal Lamb, the sacrificial lamb, and that the blood of that lamb is what brought about the atonement for sins. But then he also understood that Gentiles had this practice of standing underneath the blood of a bull and being washed in that blood. So what language does Paul use? That whenever you confess and you accept Jesus, you are washed in the blood of the lamb. That is, you take on the anointing, the grace, the strength, the endurance, the peace. You take on the newness of life in Christ. This was language Gentiles could understand. This was language that Jewish believers could understand. But what Paul forbade them to do was to engage in the dietary practices and also um, the type of practices in terms of incest that were also common amongst pagans. What he essentially said was when you confess Christ, it's not about following the Mosaic law as much as it is about living a different life now that you have confessed him. That was the requirement and that's what the letter that the council from the church for the council at Jerusalem and that the church, capital C, this is the whole church, had decided. Gentiles did not have to be circumcised. But then what we also find here, if I had to give a point or sort of sum up a point for what Paul does before he transitions into verse 11, that point would be keep track of your own journey. That's what Paul does. Paul keeps track of his own journey. So every time people would say, well, Paul, why are you preaching the way that you preach? Why are you teaching things in this way? He kept track of his own biography. He could say, because of my journey and my growth in the faith, I was one who once persecuted the church. But then I encountered Christ. And you notice he compares himself to Peter by saying, the same one who had called him to preach to the circumcised is the same one who called me to preach to the Gentiles. Because Paul constantly, and you'll see it especially throughout 2 Corinthians, he always reminded people of his resume of his curriculum vitae, if you will, his course of life. In other words, saying, I say the things that I say because of what I've been through and the life that I have lived, because of what I've suffered, because of what I've seen. And in doing so, it actually, over time, his encounter with Christ made him more humble. See, to understand Paul, Paul, like Jesus, was a blue-collar worker. Jesus and Paul shared this in common, as did all the apostles. They were blue-collar scholars. Jesus was a carpenter, that's a blue collar job. But Jesus had rabbinical training, a very expensive form of training. Of course, Jesus didn't have to pay for his, being the son of God, he knows everything. But he had classical rabbinical scholarly training so that when he spoke to the Pharisees, he could use their language, he could speak Aramaic, Hebrew, Latin, Greek, whatever was needed, could read from any scroll, so he spoke their scholarly language. Paul was a tent maker but more specifically, a leather worker, skenopoeias in the Greek. He would make tents, wineskins, sandals, sheaths for knives and swords and different things, and he did that so he could finance his education and study with Gamaliel, who was from the great tradition of the rabbis. So Rav Shaul, or Paul as we call him, was blue collar, he did manual labor, he was a craftsman, and as a matter of fact, we would say an entrepreneur. Many times as you read his letters to get money, he would make some wineskins, some sandals, whatever he needed, so that he could get enough finances to go to the next place. But he also studied day and night. 
He also studied with hopes of joining the Sanhedrin, joining the Jewish council, and being a high-ranking priest, ultimately maybe even the chief priest. So Paul came from that very scholarly tradition, even more so than Peter, who still was very much blue-collar, a fisherman. But having studied with Jesus himself, he studied at the feet of the greatest teacher that will ever walk the earth and the greatest teacher there is. So in understanding that, that helps us understand what's going to happen in verse 11. It's going to be a matter, and I always express this to Christians. Christians disagree all the time. That's why we have 41,000 denominations. The disagreements are fine if they're rooted in scripture, not opinion. If two Christians are saying, well, I'm going to embrace 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, and not even look at verses 8, 9, and 10, 11, as it results to women, as it relates to women, that's what they choose to do. But another denomination says, then I'm going to read all 27 verses of the 16th chapter of Romans. I'm going to read the entire 11th chapter of 1 Corinthians. I'm going to read Joel. I'm going to read the Acts of the Apostles. I'm going to have a completely different biblical doctrinal foundational view on the role of women in ministry. So that is the nature of what we're going to see in verse 11. This is a monumental moment for the church because it involves the two leaders of the church completely disagreeing and embracing both Jesus and scripture in two differing ways in which we're going to see that two people are right at the same time. They do not agree. And while respecting one another, one could easily see there would be dislike between the two. To be fair to Peter, we must understand the last time Peter actually saw Paul or had heard of Paul and had any involvement with him, it was after hearing about what had happened to his brother in Christ and the first deacon in the church, Stephen. Paul called for his stoning. So for Peter, as a human being, he feels a certain way about Paul. On one hand, he's happy that Paul is now preaching the gospel. On the other hand, as a human being, he's saying, you had my friend killed and in fact blasphemed against many of us and almost had many of us killed. That tension remains throughout the entirety of their careers in ministry. That tension stays there. So whenever we look at verse 11, we're now going to see Paul rebuking Peter. Verse 11 tells us, but when Cephas, that's Peter, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood self-condemned. I will stop right there. Paul says, I opposed him to his face. Um, of the many things to love about Paul, as you, whenever you read his letters, Paul regularly speaks of doing things to someone's face. He will always say, I told them to their face. I stood before them. I stand before you and say this. You have to admire Paul in that he consistently, he would write a letter as a precursor to going to see someone. So I can only imagine Paul would have been the type of person to post something on the gram and send a tweet, but the tweet normally would have been, stay right where you are, I'm on the way. It was that kind of tweet. He, he wasn't someone to go back and forth all day. It was, I'm coming to see you, so that way there'll be no confusion. And the word he uses here is aunt. Histamine. You're probably thinking, that looks like antihistamine, because this is the root word for antihistamine in Greek. Antihistamine. It means to hold your ground. To not surrender. To nobly resist. He's saying, I stood my ground with Peter. We must understand he's standing his ground with the person that Jesus appointed to lead the twelve. Peter, in the Catholic tradition, is known as the first pope. That is the extent to which he is authoritative. Even the kings of England consider their throne to be the rock of St. Peter. Paul standing before Peter, everyone was on Peter's side. If you're present at the council at Jerusalem, I said and had mentioned, and Luke says, James, the brother of Jesus, agreed with Peter. And John, the apostle John, agreed with Peter. The remaining apostles who were all living at that time agreed with Peter. A majority of everyone agreed with Peter, and even Barnabas, who was doing missionary work with Paul, ultimately defects back to Peter. Peter was the authority. 
But Peter began doing something that angered Paul deeply. And Paul is one to get angry often. He's, he's honest about it. He even says, who is indignant? And I am not indignant. Paul stayed angry about something righteously. Peter had stopped eating with Gentiles in public. That angered Paul deeply. What Paul so understood about Jesus and what once angered him about Jesus was it was unthinkable and unseemly for a rabbi to eat with tax collectors, Samaritans, women, Gentiles, the unclean, anyone who was hemorrhaging, children, Greeks. Rabbis were supposed to be so set apart that they never even ate in public with anyone except other rabbis or people considered clean or even in private. And Jesus completely demolished that tradition. Peter personally, personally sat alongside Jesus and saw this and sat with him many times, even himself. You can find in the Gospels where he was upset with Jesus for allowing a woman to wash his feet with precious perfume, upset with Jesus for engaging on a regular basis with those persons considered unclean. And then Peter himself actually regresses. He stops eating with the Gentiles. And this angers Paul deeply. So let's look at verses 12, 13, and 14. For until certain people came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles. But after they came back, he drew back and kept himself separate for fear of the circumcision faction. The circumcision faction would have been Jewish believers who believe everyone should be circumcised to follow Jesus. Paul is highly upset that Peter, this great authoritative figure, would allow the crowd, would allow cliques and groups and peer pressure ultimately to keep him from doing what he was supposed to do. He would not eat with the Gentiles. What Jesus wanted and still wants and even what the communion table signifies is that we're supposed to be in Christ a new type of family. That as long as someone has confessed Christ and even if they have not yet, you believe that they will. So you break out a plate and you pull up a chair at the table. In other words, you don't keep people away. You, there are no reserved sections. One thing in my personal ministry I've gotten in trouble for in some ways and still don't care to this day. If you know me and if you've known me in 17 years, I never do head tables. Never done head tables, ever. What I did for nine years, even before I got to Calvary, is I always ate last. The infirmed, anyone who could not stand, anyone in a wheelchair, they ate first. And anyone who could walk helped anyone who could not walk. And I would ask for the children to then serve those who were oldest. For those who were able-bodied, who were healthy, me included, if I needed to take a plate to someone, the people needed to see the pastor as human. This is the ministry of Jesus. He washed his disciples' feet. While that's not an ordinance in the missionary Baptist tradition, it is exemplary of how we should behave. I never sat at a head table. And then it got to a point after a couple of years, I said, I don't know why you're planning anniversaries and why you're doing head tables. I will not, under any circumstance, sit at a head table. I will find a place to sit amongst the people. Um, I want to say maybe just once in the past year, I think maybe there was a head table. I don't know because I went to sit. I think it was maybe during a men's day breakfast. I don't do head tables. Um, I just don't find, I don't find in the New Testament where um, the role of pastor separates himself from the people in that way. Um, that's just me. I, I, I can't find it in the New Testament. Similarly, what I do see with Paul Paul recognized that because Jesus so regularly ate with sinners and tax collectors, Samaritans, prostitutes, the unclean, and Peter learned that. And now because he had become so exalted, because he became big time, as somebody said to me, now, now he, he's moved up you know, to the six series. He went from the three series to the six series. So he couldn't be seen just eating with Gentiles anymore. Now all of a sudden he's only eating with the circumcised, with the quote unquote clean. And this deeply had upset Paul. Um, not only that, when we look at verse 12, that he used to eat, the word for eat there is synesthio. What this implies is that there is warmth. 
It literally means to eat, but that there's warmth. There's an invitation. You're welcome. Come and, come and get a plate, sit down at the table. We, we want you with us. And in fact, what the church does, the world may not want you, we want you. The world may have said these things about you. Grab a plate and, and, and sit here. We want you. No matter where you've been, no matter where you've come from, we want you. We, we, we're, we're setting a place mat up for you. We're getting a plate for you. We want you here. Senestio. We want that warmth. We want that togetherness. Senestio. Um, so, verse 13 now. And the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. A very important word that Jesus used to describe the Pharisees. But to be a hypocrite in the New Testament has a very important detail. I want us to understand something about the way Hippo Hippocrate is used in the New Testament. We know what a hypocrite is, and the meaning in the Bible is similar, but there's a brilliant thing that we can miss. Hippocrate, it literally means actor. Two faces. If um, you know anything about the Greek theater, the actors would step on stage and they would have a mask in their hands and they would put the mask on and they would speak their lines and then they would step off stage and remove the mask. And Jesus was basically saying those Pharisees said what was right, but they were actors. Um, they, they would put on, um, they, they would put on a performance and they could sound legitimate and, and they could even look legitimate until you saw them step off stage. That is until you looked at their life and you saw the mask fall. Hippocrate. And what Paul is saying is that Peter is engaging in two-facedness. Um, he's claiming to preach the gospel and, and to um, want to proliferate, that is spread the gospel and invite everyone in, but then he's sitting in the reserve section at the head table, and then the little people sit in some other place. Um, so again, verse 13, and the other Jews joined him in this hypocrisy so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Verse 14, but when I saw that they were not acting consistently, so notice the word acting, they were not acting consistently with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas, who was Peter, before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews? Um, that would be a mic drop for, for Paul. What he's saying is, you are doing the types of things that pagans do. So if you, Peter, are going to live like a pagan, then why do you want pagans to live like Jews? In other words, if you're not even going to be consistent, if you're going to be inconsistent, why do you want them to be consistent? Why do you want them to have the Mosaic law and to accept Christ when you yourself have walked with Christ and you do not do the things that you know that you are supposed to do in Christ. So if you wanted to give a, a second point to that, I, I, I often say this. Christians do not have to like one another. They should like one another. They must love one another, must respect one another, must appreciate one another. They must do that. And it goes to reason if you love and appreciate and respect someone that you would like them. But if anyone were to ask me, well, how can you love somebody and not like them? My only response would be, and this is the Jerry Grimes response, but perhaps somebody else can, can identify with this. How can you love someone and not like them? All I'm going to say is maybe at some point you have family members that you absolutely love, but at the same time, and I will leave it there, you can love someone but not like the way they live or approve of things that they do or not agree with them on certain things, but you do love them. You would do anything for them, but there are some very stark disagreements that you have with them on important things. There's no doubt that Peter and Paul loved one another, but they had completely 180 degree opposite views of how the church was to grow. And what God does, God works through rivals. Dr. King had one view. Brother Malcolm had another view. God worked through both to bring about justice to bring about a better life for so many. So just because there are rivals who may disagree, if they understand they're on the same team playing different positions, and if they are living out their calling consistent with what God has called them to do, there can still be the uplifting of the kingdom, but it's just that there are going to be certain teammates that don't get along. They are great teammates. They can still get the job done. Peter and Paul 
many times are described as Peter versus Paul or Paul versus Peter. You had to choose one or the other. So in many instances, overwhelmingly, because Paul wrote so much more and because almost 65% of the New Testament belongs to Paul's hand, over time we have come to agree with Paul in a number of matters. Um, and so now, as we move on to the, the conclusion of this, verses 15 through 21. So, verse 15. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So a matter here is the matter of Romans chapter 8 versus James chapter 2. Many people will ask, is it works or is it faith? This is where the difference is split. If you are justified by faith, your works will, ref will reflect the works of a faithful person. So ultimately, if you are truly changed by Jesus, your life is going to reflect the life of someone who has faith in Jesus. So to be justified by faith, and we must be justified by faith. We can't be justified by our works. It's the crucifixion that justifies us. And what is meant by justification is salvation. We're saved by the death of Jesus on the cross, and then by his subsequent resurrection, his ascension, and then his promise of his imminent return. We're justified. Only Jesus can justify. Nothing else can justify us. Ultimately, there's nothing we can do that can wash away our flaws, our sins, nothing. Only confession in Jesus who died in the place of our sins does that. So we're justified by faith. So that's what Paul is stressing here. So again, I'm just going to read verse 16 again. Yet we know that a person is justified not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by doing the works of the law. Because no one will be justified by the works of the law. But if in our efforts to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners, is Christ then a servant of sin? Certainly not. But if I build up again the very things that I once tore down, then I demonstrate that I'm a transgressor. I'm just going to pause for a moment there. Paul is saying, I spent time persecuting the church before I knew better. Now that I know better, why would I try to rebuild the very thing that must be torn down, which is persecuting people who were not under the law of Moses? Verse 19, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. What this means is the place of the old covenant is to understand how it is fulfilled in Christ. That all 39 books of what we call our Old Testament points towards fulfillment in Christ. But we must also understand Christ himself said, I did not come to abolish the law, but that it would be fulfilled. Meaning the law was temporary. It, it, it was a, a holding pattern, if you will, until we could arrive at our true destination, which is reconciliation to God in Christ. Um, if you had to, you know, give a final point for verses 15 through 21, um, it is simply this. Christ can do what we cannot do. When it's all said and done, Christ can do what we cannot do. And by comparison, there's very little that we can do. For as much, quote unquote, control as we think we have, I'm always reminded right now, at this very moment, we are spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. And it does not feel as if we're spinning at 1,000 miles per hour. That is the speed with which the earth is revolving. And yet we don't feel that. And that perfectly aligned through God's design, every day is 23.6 hours. That's a fact. Every, no day is perfectly 24 hours. Every day is always off a little bit, 23.6 hours. A day on Mars is 24.1 hours. Why? 
every planet must succinctly organize and compensate its time and its rotation so that the rotation in the entire solar system is never thrown off. If it's thrown off once, the entire solar system is destroyed and we're pulled into the sun. No human being has the power to create such and then to order such, which means even while we were asleep, God has perfectly seen to it that every day will be its perfect length, that the solar system will operate as it should. We're still trying to figure out if we have eight or nine planets in our solar system. Meanwhile, God has seen to it that the sun keeps shining, that the world keeps revolving. Even right now, as some of us are in the midst of cleaning up debris and putting things back together, don't you know that in one week, in two weeks, we'll be worshiping with one another? If it be the, Lord will, the Lord's will that we rise up the next day and the things that bother us right now won't bother us next week? That God is so good a month from now, there's some things you're going through right now in which God is going to bless you with amnesia and you won't even remember it next month. For as bad as certain things are, there's some things you've been through in your past and you can't remember how bad they are because you forgot them. That if you're not even reminded, unless someone reminds you, you will say, you know, I had actually forgotten about that. But at the time, it seemed like the hardest thing in the world. Christ can do all that we cannot do. The healing that we can't do, he can do. That problem that we can't figure out, he can figure it out. That issue that we have, he works it out. He can do what we cannot do. That is why we're justified in him. And he does this for one reason, because he loves us. As Paul so beautifully says, another identifying theme in all of Paul's authentic letters is this. Paul is fixated upon his own mortal demise that he may be with Christ. So you constantly read in his letters how often he talks about his own death. That he says, for instance, in the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians, by my faith in Christ Jesus, I die every day. That every day there's something in me that needs to die, and I don't need to carry it with me tomorrow. By my faith in Christ Jesus. Finally, I want us to journey over, um, as, as we conclude here, to the Gospel of Luke. Um, I, I want us to see how the master handled this same situation when it comes to pulling up a plate and, and, and just being around people. I want us to look at the seventh chapter. Verses, I'm going to start with verse 18. I'm going to read up to verse 35 in Luke's gospel. The evangelist Luke, chapter 7, verse 18. Um, the context here is that there were disciples of John the Baptist who were now starting to um, defer to Jesus. And so this is a point in time in which both John the Baptist and Jesus um, are both preaching and there comes this question because Jesus and John are so different in their ministries. Jesus is much more what we would call down-to-earth, relatable, whereas John was much more the, the fiery, prophetic voice. So verse 18 tells us, the disciples of John reported all these things to him. So John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits, and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor have good news brought to them, and blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. When John's messengers had gone, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who put on fine clothing and live in luxury are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written. See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, no one is greater than John, yet the least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. 
And all the people who heard this, including the tax collectors, acknowledged the justice of God because they had been baptized with John's baptism. But by refusing to be baptized by him, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves. To what then will I compare the people of this generation? And what are they like? They are like children sitting in the marketplace and calling to one another. We played the flute for you and you did not dance. We wailed and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Nevertheless, wisdom is vindicated by all her children. Some translations say wisdom is justified by all her children. The person with whom you eat is more important than anyone else. Many people will not eat with certain people in public and don't want to be seen with certain people in public. Jesus ate with tax collectors, sinners, anyone. And he did not really much care what anyone thought about it because he knew what he had been called to do. He understood his mission. And rhetorically is asking them, when you went to see John, who did you go to see? A prophet. But not only that, there's this juxtaposition. John was too difficult for the people. And Jesus was down to earth. And yet the people were not happy. In so many instances, when we think about the intimacy of eating, sharing a meal, breaking bread, it is easily the most intimate thing two people can do because you must eat in order to stay alive. Eating is absolutely necessary to stay alive. So when you're eating with someone, you are actually engaging in the very thing that keeps you alive. One, one time, some time ago, the Lord placed it upon my heart, I guess, to share a second, ministry, uh, second story of ministry. I'm old enough now. I'm starting to get old enough. Um, and long enough in the tooth that I can now tell stories from 15, 16, 17 years ago in ministry, in which I was administering communion, and during communion, what typically I would do is I would pause after the end of service. There would be no benediction, but after the invitation, I would allow anyone who needed to leave the sanctuary to leave, and I would ask them politely to quietly leave and to leave the vestibule and to step outside as Anyone who wanted to share in the Lord's Supper could then move closer, and then I would administer the ordinance of communion. I will never forget there came this one Sunday where, as I was in the midst of reciting the litany and reciting what Jesus said to his disciples in the upper room, and I could hear people laughing. And then I looked up as I was reciting the litany, and I noticed that there were people on their phone during communion laughing and looking at something on their phone. And these were not children. These were not young people. Uh, these were individuals who I would have thought would have known better, or would have been older saints, who I would have thought would have understood the importance of what is engraved on the table, this do in remembrance of me. So then I paused. And I looked at them. And I said to them, when we commemorate the death of our Lord and Savior, in this moment, he is present with us. He is always present with us, but in this moment, we are communing with him. If he did not do this, then when we die, we go to hell. What he did at that table is the means through which we have eternal life. It is the centerpiece of the faith. It is what makes us followers of Jesus. There's 168 hours in a week. He's only asking for a few minutes that we shut down everything and only focus our hearts and our minds on him. And even Paul speaks language to this effect. That if we examine anything except our own heart, then we eat and drink in damnation to our soul. And for this reason, some are sick and some are dying. And so I said to them, I am reciting not my words, but the words of the Lord Jesus. There are no words that are spoken in a sanctuary more important than his words. So I ask that if you have anything to say or do at this time that is inconsistent with this ordinance, the door and the exit is available to you. 
but I have been entrusted as a custodian of this place and a manager of the mysteries of the eternal. And Jesus deserves our respect. He died for us. And then after a moment, I paused and I continued and all was well. Now, do I think they were cussing me out under their breath, in their brain, in, in their mind? Probably to this day. But I did not want to stand before God on judgment day and have to answer this question. Why did you let them disrespect me in my house? That was my concern. So whenever we engage in a meal, it is the most holy and sacred thing that we can ever do. That is why the Lord's Supper, it is the centerpiece of the faith. To break bread is holy. It's sacred. It's intimate. To that point, breaking bread is universal. When we think of Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg, 30 years ago, whenever Snoop Dogg was on trial for his life, I don't know if anyone remembers, he was on trial and was facing life in prison. And at that time, Martha Stewart had a Kmart line, and she was coming on television every week and making muffins and brownies and everything else. If anyone had told you one day, Snoop Dogg from Long Beach, California, Calvin Brodus, and Martha Stewart will be doing a show together, and not only that, if someone told you Snoop Dogg will be found innocent, and to this day has never been to prison, now he's been to jail, but never prison, but Martha Stewart, would serve federal prison time. I know because I lived in North Carolina where she was there. Now, from my understanding, she kind of ran the yard. They gave her her own gardening supplies and everything, and, and you know, she held it down, but she served federal time. She even once said, I went out to dinner with Ice-T, Cat Williams, and Snoop Dogg, and I said, I'm at a table with three black men, and I'm the only one who's done federal time out of all of you. But she was breaking bread with them because she said during that time, it humbled her, and she saw life in a completely different way. She saw life differently. And to this day, she's close friends with 50 Cent and Snoop Dogg. They hang out. I thought it was a publicity stunt, but as it turns out, Snoop said, you know, Martha's cool. They, you know, hang out at the house, make muffins, and, you know, play PlayStation. That's the power of breaking bread. Breaking bread can take a brother from Long Beach, from, you know, gangster rap, and someone from suburbia who makes muffins, and they can break bread together. That's the power of, of grabbing a plate. That's the power of, uh, of pulling out a place at the dinner table. And so even in those places where there's disagreements in the faith, perhaps it is at the table that all is made right. As we depart, um, I just want to take a moment to ask, do we have any questions? No questions, Pastor. No questions? Any prayer requests? Yes, we have two prayer requests. The first prayer request is from uh, Sister Teresa Gordon. She's asking for prayer for her dad, James Tyus. He's in Olympia Fields Hospital. Brother James Tyus, Sister Teresa Gordon. The second prayer request is from Early Armstrong. Prayer for her granddaughter. She's having surgery in Lafayette, Indiana tomorrow. Sister Early Armstrong. Her granddaughter. Yes. Surgery tomorrow. Yes. In Lafayette. Amen. Do we have any other prayer requests? That's all. Um, of course, we want to continue to keep in prayer our own brother Melvin McDowell. We're continuing to lift him up in prayer. We thank God for him um, and for each and every one of our members, um, particularly. Over the course of this pandemic, um, some members may know, others may not know, I've been, when requested, I, I have been preaching eulogies um, steadily um, throughout um, when requested. Um, but likewise, we've also had um, a wedding. Um, so we also, we thank God for Brother Richard and Sister Vivian Hurd. Um, they are newly wed, so we thank God for them. So even in the midst of these times, we thank God for, um, for their nuptials. And so we're just... Um, praying for their continued blessed union, and we just thank God for their matrimony. And so we just want to continue to encourage one another. Um, yes, Brother McDowell, did we? Yes, we want to continue to pray for Brother Joe Williams and Sister Nadalyn Williams um, in their time of bereavement, in their time of mourning, in the entire Williams family. 
Um, as always, we want to lift up the leadership of our church family and the leadership of all churches right now for every single church family, for all of our sister congregations of every denomination, of, of every tradition within the Christian faith. We're just praying for their continued endurance and their strength at this time for all of your leaders, for your members, for the family members of each and every body of Christ within the body of Christ. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship and study. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are present with us, that as we join with one another and touch and agree from afar, O oh God, we thank you for the power, for the fire of your word that dwells within us, for the strength that you give us. Lord, we thank you that you are so good that no matter what we face, no matter what we encounter, you are still with us and we are still here. God, we thank you that you are so mighty that even as we have brothers and sisters who right now are preparing for surgery, we have some right now who are overcoming illness and overcoming difficulties. God, we know that week after week, Tuesday after Tuesday, Wednesday after Wednesday, Sunday after Sunday, Sabbath day after Sabbath day, you continue blessing, you continue healing, you continue strengthening, you continue walking with us. God, we bless your name and we praise your name and we lift you up. Lord, I I'm praying right now that where there is a need for healing, that all who are in need of healing, that where there is physical aches, where there are physical strains, where there is physical agony and pain, God, I pray right now for the cessation, for the relief of agony and aching. Lord, where there is mental anxiety, where there's psychological worry, where there's depression or stress, God, I pray right now for the fullness of your Holy Spirit, that you would cast out the demons of doubt and depression and despair and anxiety. Lord, where there may be worries or feelings of uncertainty, I pray right now that you shall grant certainty, confidence, blessed assurance, O oh God, that we will know that we are not only conquerors, but more than conquerors in your word. God, we pray for the first responders. We are praying for parents and their strength. We're praying for teachers and educators as they now return to schools. We're praying for the safety of citizens of every country, residents of every state, residents of every county and village. God, we're praying for the members of every church family, for every pastor. God, we're praying for all deacons and all elders and all bishops and all ministry leaders. And Heavenly Father, we're praying now that even in the evening, that as there are brothers and sisters right now who are patiently and who are waiting for their power to be restored, some waiting for debris to be moved, some waiting for repairs to be done. We know Know that you are a repairing God. We know that you are an obstacle moving God. We know that you are a God who not only gives light but gives power. But in the meantime, you give us a light that Com Ed can't give. You give us a power that Com Ed can't give. We have power in your name. We have authority in your name. So Lord, we're thanking you right now for all that you shall do. We bless your name for we know that your name is mighty. So we call upon your name. We call upon your name for help. We call upon your name for healing. We call upon your name for strength. We call upon your name for guidance. We call upon your name that you would give us hope and greater hope and move us from strength to greater strength and renewed strength. This prayer we offer to you in the powerful name, in that mighty name, in that soul saving name, in that healing name, in that wonderful name, in the wonderful name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. May all of God's people say amen, amen Amen and amen. May God bless you. May the peace of God and may the grace of God be with you. I look forward to joining with you tomorrow morning on our prayer line at 630 Central Time. And I look forward to worshiping our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ with you in spirit and in truth this Sunday. God bless you. Hey, Calvary family, and to our extended social media family and friends, Deuteronomy 16 and 17 says, Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord thy God, which he hath given thee. Did you know Calvary has four ways of giving? Giving way number one, giving in person. Feel free to drop off your offerings in person here at the church during our normal business hours. 
Tuesday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. Giving way number two, United States Postal Service mail. Feel free to send your offerings by regular mail. Giving way number three, online giving. Give online on our Realm app. The Realm app is for members of Calvary only. If you are a member and not connected to Realm, please contact the church and speak with our secretary. Giving way number four to our Calvary family and extended family and friends via social media and YouTube who are not connected to Realm. We also have text giving where you can give via texting on your mobile device. Please text the words Calvary Glenwood. That's Calvary Glenwood and the dollar amount to 73256. Again, text Calvary Glenwood and the dollar amount to 73256 and follow the prompts to complete the process for giving. Again, four ways of giving, giving in person, United States Postal Service mail, online giving, and text giving. Should you have questions about giving, feel free to contact our church secretary or finance office by calling the church. Thank you for your gifts, and God bless you all. Hey, Calvary, here's how you can give. Log on to your Realm account. In the top left-hand corner, press the menu key. Find giving. Click the icon to add your giving amount. How much would you like to give? Under the amount, enter that amount. Select ties and offerings. Select today's date and press continue. Once you've confirmed your giving, that concludes the process for giving via Realm. Thank you for your contributions. Welcome to the Church of Love.